please join me in welcoming Pastor Well, thank you. It's good to see you. It's good to be up with you tonight. And uh, Rhonda, thank you. Uh, TC, thank you. John, good to see you as always. As Rhonda said, I'm a native Oklahoman, born and raised in Edmond. Uh, went to Edmond High School, played football there, was recruited to play college ball at Oklahoma State by Jimmy Johnson. Played five years at Oklahoma State, was drafted by Mike Ditka, played with the Chicago Bears, finished with the Minnesota Vikings. And as was shared at the age of 26, I gave my heart and life to Christ. Uh, was a businessman, in fact still am. I'm uh, still a half owner of a business in the Oklahoma City community, but I'm basically retired from operations and was called into ministry. Been pastoring for 13 years. We've been blessed with a tremendous church, tremendous church family. Uh, we have a radio ministry called Exploring the Word. We're on in five states. Unfortunately, on Bot Radio in Oklahoma, we don't quite reach up here into the Tulsa area. We're in the central part of the state. And uh, travel the country speaking about biblical principles of government, America's Christian heritage, and Islam, among other things. So it's a pleasure to be with you. I hand out some cards. Are actually, actually uh, Representative Ben, and please forgive me, I got a uh, throat lozenge in my mouth. I uh, have the good old uh, early makings of a cold, so I'm doped up on my cold medication, so I'm liable to start speaking in tongues. I'm not even charismatic. <laughs> and um, they've got a little throat lozenge working here, so please forgive me for that. But Mr. Bennett handed out some cards. Those are simply registration cards. Don't, do not feel like you're obligated to fill those out. If you fill those out, I'd like to have a record of it. Uh, I'd like to have your email address for our Reclaiming America for Christ email list. I will not harass you. I will not ask you for money. I will not sell the list. I promise you. I don't have time to send out waste of time emails. We send out maybe six or eight emails a year, and it's only because they're important. So if you would like to be on that list, please fill out that card. Please drop it off at the table over here. Actually, we'll probably pick them up. Uh, and then at the end, we'll draw out of those cards, and I'll give away a copy of a five-DVD uh, set called Islam 101. I'm going to do a very brief overview tonight. That will be a more in-depth study. So we'll do a drawing out of that list of names to give away a set of that. As Rhonda said, I'd like to encourage you to support uh, the Give Me Liberty Tour. Uh, folks, we have been conned uh, partially just through ignorance of our, of our own and partially through the educational system, which is controlled by the federal government. We are not ruled by a dictatorship in Washington. We did not elect a dictatorial president that rules over 310 million people. We supposedly have, in fact, if you read the Declaration, you read the Constitution, we have an agreement between the states that delegated very few and limited responsibilities to this federal government, this national, I hate the word not national, this federal government, and they're supposed to be working on our behalf, answerable to us. First words of the Constitution, we the people of the United States, they're supposed to work for us. They are bound by the law just as anybody. And if they pass a law, for example, Obamacare, which is clearly unconstitutional because we never delegated the authority for them to take control over health care, then it's unconstitutional. If they pass a law that's illegal, then it's not a law. And it's up to the states at that point in time to say, Washington, thank you very much. We're all in favor of the Supremacy Clause in areas where we have delegated you that authority. But in this case, you don't have the authority. Therefore, we are not going to enforce Obamacare in our state. Now, we need courageous legislators to do that. And uh, praise the Lord, I was glad to hear that Senator Brogdon, former Senator Brogdon, is de declared to run for, for office. He is truly a liberty candidate. Uh, folks, we've got to learn and hit the ground early. The general election, it's too late. The primary elections are where the battles are won and lost. As Rhonda mentioned, I ran for a state senate. What a mistake. No, it wasn't. It was actually a great experience. <laughs> against uh, the most powerful man in the state Senate. Uh, he is the Appropriations and Budget Chairman. It means he's got the checkbook, carries a checkbook for the Senate, and consequently a lot of people want to uh, earn his favor and they contribute heavily to his campaign. Now it's interesting on the surface we're both Republicans. Okay, I'm a Republican, he's a Republican. No difference, right? Uh, we both are professing Christians. Well, you don't know, but we both profess to be Christians. Uh, we both are Baptists, okay? So we're virtually identical. We both claim to be conservative. Okay, so as you go down the checklist, we look to be the exact same person, don't we? Should be a real easy race for anybody that's involved. They can't lose. However, the powers that be, the State Chamber of Commerce, invested $800,000 in this race. Why? If we're basically the same person, then who cares who wins? Well, there's a difference. 
And we've got to learn that. We've got to understand that. We've got to get behind the liberty-minded candidates that are going to represent us, represent, uphold the rule of law, rather than representing the special interests that fund their campaigns and keep them in office. So this Give Me Liberty Tour is very important. It'll be a tremendous learning experience. And we're uh, right now we have almost 20 events scheduled across the state. We begin this weekend in Skyatook at the Emanuel Baptist Church in Skyatook. Please grab one of these flyers. And if you can make it, come to the event at 5 o'clock Sunday night in Skyatook. Uh, next weekend, we're going to be in Grove on uh, Sunday evening. And then uh, the following weekend, we're going to be in Weatherford. Again, we've got nearly 20 events scheduled throughout the course of the, uh, the, over the whole state, and we're hoping to double that before we're uh, finished. So anyway, I invite you to attend this week. I invite you to work heavily in promoting the event this March, as we'll be here on March the 13th. Well, again, yes, ma'am. What church? It'll be Emmanuel Baptist Church in Skyatook mm -hmm. from 5 to 8 uh, this upcoming Sunday. As I said a little bit ago, I am going to rush through a brief overview on the subject of Islam. But as an American citizen, when you get done with this one hour presentation, you will know more about the subject than 95% of anybody in the United States and 100% of anybody that resides within the city limits of Washington, D.C. So we're going to cover four topics. We're going to cover briefly, do we worship the same God? Big question. What is the background of Islam? History. History is important. It makes a major component of Sharia. What is Sharia? Number four. What about America? Well, first of all, let's begin with this slide. Former President Bush, when interviewed, made the statement in 2003, the London Telegraph, I believe we worship the same God, made the statement with Charles Gibson in 2004, I think we do. We have different routes of getting to the Almighty. Well, that's interesting to me because as a Christian, my Bible says that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So it's interesting that Mr. Bush would make that statement. However, let me present to you this slide. If you were to visit Nazareth uh, and a tour of the Holy Land, of course, Nazareth, a very important site, a city where Jesus was raised in his early years. And it was at this location that uh, uh, supposedly, this is called the Church of the Annunciation, it's a Catholic church there. And it was supposedly in this proximity that Mary was visited by the angel Gabriel to announce that she was uh, going to bear the Christ child. So this is a, obviously a popular spot for Christians making a pilgrimage to uh, the Holy Land. Well, in front of the church on Arab property, you've got this tract, is what it is. It's a banner. And it says this, it's for all the Christians that come there to visit. In the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful, say, O Muhammad, He is Allah, the one and only Allah, the eternal absolute. He begetteth not, nor was He begotten, and there is none like unto Him. Now, folks, perhaps the most famous verse of Scripture in the entire Bible is John 3.16. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Well, folks, this is a direct refutation of John 3.16. Now, either the Quran is true or the Bible is true, but they can't both be true because they disagree with each other. As a matter of fact, you see the picture up here. It says, uh, Islam will conquer Rome. Jesus is the slave of Allah. Well, my Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. Well, let's see what the Quran actually says about the deity of Christ. Surah 575 says this, Christ, the son of Mary, was no more than a messenger. Many were the messengers that passed away way before him. Surah 930, the Christians call Christ the Son of God. That's a saying of their mouth. And this they but imitate what the unbelievers of old used to say, Allah's curse be upon them, how they are deluded from the truth. Surah 517, infidels are those who declare that God is the Christ, the Son of Mary. Well, I believe that Jesus Christ is God incarnate. Guess what that makes me? Amen. An infidel. Surah 573, infidels are those that say that God is one of three in Trinity. I believe in the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and Holy Spirit. So what does that make me, infidel? Surah 551, believers take neither the Jews nor your Christians for, nor Christians for your friends. Well, that's an interesting thing. As I've read the Old Testament, the New Testament, it seems that God uh, thinks pretty highly of both the Jews and the Christians. Well, what does the Bible say about this? Well, John 1, we of course know, says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, we know that uh, the Word was made flesh and dwelt, and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Colossians 2, 9, for in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Isaiah 7, 14, therefore the Lord Him shall to give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. You shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And the name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. 
John 20, 29, Thomas, when he had doubted, but now seeing Jesus in his resurrected glory, fell on his knees before him and said, My Lord and my God. Of course, 1 Timothy 3, 16 says, Great without controversy is, is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. So the question is, who is Jesus? Folks, you can take any religion in the world and define it by two questions. Number one, who is Jesus? He is either God incarnate who died for the sins of his creation, or he is something else. Good man, prophet, an angel, a lunatic, a liar. But the answer to that question is very important. Second question that you have to ask yourself is how do you appropriate salvation? It's either something that we earn because we deserve it, or it is by grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. On those two questions, you can divide any religion in the world. Well, who is Jesus? The Quran says that Jesus is merely a messenger, merely a prophet. As a matter of fact, the second of the prophets. Moses was the first prophet, or the first, now there are many prophets, but Moses gave the Old Testament, Jesus brought the, the New Testament, and then Muhammad brought the final revelation. He's the last and the greatest prophet. Well, is Jesus simply just a man? Or is he, in fact, God incarnate? Two distinct differences. Well, what about the resurrection? Kind of important in Christianity, don't you think? <coughs> Surah 4, 157 says this, that they said, We killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. But they killed him not, nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear to them. And those who differ therein are full of doubts, with no knowledge, but only conjecture to follow, for of a surety they killed him not. As a preacher, let me tell you, the resurrection is a rather important topic. What does the Bible have to say? Romans 5, 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Corinthians 15, 8, Paul talks about the gospel. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel by which also you are saved. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Matthew 16, 4, Jesus said that, that, will, that the identification that he was, in fact, who he said he was, was the fact that he'd only be in the tomb for three days and three nights. Uh, Romans 1, 3, and 4 said that this was the declaration that would declare into all the world that he was who he said he was. What was that? The resurrection from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 17 through 19, and if Christ be not raised, then your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. Now folks, there's two different messages here. One is that Jesus was merely a man who didn't die for anybody's sins. One is that Jesus was God incarnate that died for the sins of the world and rose again to prove it. That is not the same message. Now either this is true or this is true. But they can't both be true at the same time because they disagree with one another. So Mr. Bush says this, well first of all I believe in an almighty God and I believe that all the world, whether they be Muslim, Christian or any other religion, prays to the same God. That's what I believe, that's what Bush says. I believe that Islam is a great religion that preaches peace. It's interesting that Sheikh Adel Shahato, who was in an Egyptian prison prior to the fall of Mubarak, was interviewed and made this statement, senior official in Egyptian Islamic Jihad, if we come to power we will launch a campaign of Islamic conquest to instate Sharia worldwide. The Christian is free to worship his God. Wait a second, I thought we all worshiped the same God. In his church. But if the Christians make problems for the Muslims, obviously we are two distinct groups, I will exterminate them. So we've got an issue there. What did the uh, Quran say that Christians were called? Yeah. Infidels. We've got an issue. Topic number two, what is the background of Islam? First of all, Muhammad uh, recognized the history of the Arabian Peninsula. At the time of Muhammad, the Arabian Peninsula was a polytheistic region. They had 360 gods. They, uh, one god for each day of the, the lunar year. The uh, chief deity was the uh, moon god. Uh, Mecca had a black box in it, their temple, um, called the al Kaaba. It was there that uh, they had uh, uh, deities, all the deities were worshipped. This was in fact a holy site. Uh, looking at the history of this particular topic under Arabian religions, Encyclopedia Britannica, forgive me, again, battling cold and a few things, a little bit, uh, little bit logy today. 1979, by the way, whenever you get out and gather books, try to find old books. Find old dictionaries, find old world book encyclopedias before they can continue to sanitize them. South Arabian deity, deities. In the official cults of the South Arabian kingdoms, the devotees venerated most highly a triad of deities. They were astral in character, the moon god, the sun goddess, and the god they equated with Venus. 
Each of these deities bore a variety of names depending upon the region or a particular attribute of the divinity. Chief among the triad was the moon god who was the protector of principal cities. The people of the various kingdoms and areas referred to themselves as his offspring, under, each under a different name. The Sabians were the children of Lumphal. Well, go on down here. Chief among the triad was the moon god who was the protector of the principal cities. Sin was the name of the moon god of ancient Babylon. Uh, in each region, other names of the moon god appear, derived from aspects of the lunar cycle and other attributes. From your Bible studies, you recognize the influence of the moon god in biblical times. Uh, Sennacherib, the ancient king of Babylon, was a worshiper of the moon god. Sinai, uh, the Sinai Peninsula, the wilderness of sin, all of these were in reverence of the moon god. When Moses led the children of Israel out of the uh, land of Egypt, what did God warn them not to do? Do not worship the host of heaven. Don't worship the sun, the moon, the stars. So this area, the Arabian Peninsula, was polytheistic. They had a different god for each day of the lunar year, with the chief deity being the moon god Sin. Now Muhammad was born in 570. He was of the Koresh tribe. Now let me try to explain that to you so that as Christian you'd understand. The tribe of Levi had the responsibility of upkeep and taking care of the temple or the tabernacle prior to that. The Koresh tribe had the responsibility of taking care of al Kaaba. That was their responsibility. He was born into this tribe. His father died at a young age. He was raised by his uncle. His uncle died. He was raised by his grandfather who was in charge of the upkeep of al Kaaba. As a youngster he grew up traveled. Uh, of course Mecca was not exactly a, a lush garden place so um, this was on a trade caravan here. They would trade and, and gather food and make textiles and things of that nature and he uh, also traveled extensively up and down that as a young man growing up working in the caravans. Um, learned from conversation. Wasn't just polytheists in the Arabian Peninsula, although that was the majority in virtually all the Arabians, but you also had Jews that lived in Arabia. Remember, the Byzantine Empire was ruling here and Jews were not welcome there. You also had deviant forms of Christianity like the Ebionites that denied the deity of Christ that also lived in the Arabian Peninsula. So it was from that background that Muhammad had his education. At the age of 25 he married a wealthy and influential trader woman by the name of Kadijah. At the age of 40, he was meditating at a cave near Mecca, the cave of Hiran. It was here that he believed he had his first revelation. He believed it was confused at first. Anything from a jinn or a genie eventually settled on the fact that this was Gabriel uh, telling him that he was the last and greatest prophet. 613, between 16 and 613, Muhammad didn't do much with this vision. 613, he began preaching his message in Mecca. And here's the point I want us to make. This is all kind of, it's more extensive in here, and you'll understand why we cover a little bit of this if you get the videos. But in 620, Muhammad's uh, uncle Abu Talib dies, and his wife Khadijah dies. Very important. He had been preaching this message for nearly a decade. It had virtually no followers, less than 100 by anybody's arithmetic. Uh, family members, some poor and the like. Preaching his new revelation of ministry, he had virtually no followers. After his protectors left, Abu Talib, his wife, he was welcomed to leave Mecca by those that were left. He wound up making his hijra to Medina. This, by the way, is when the Islamic calendar begins, when he departed from Mecca to the city of the prophet. And here's the point I want to make. When Muhammad was preaching the message in Mecca. It was basically this, I'm the last and the greatest prophet. Also, you're a Jew, well, I'm greater than Moses. Well, how do you think the, how do you think the Jews responded to that? <laughs> we don't think so. Uh, you're a Christian, well, I'm greater than Jesus. How do you think the Christians responded to that? No. To the polytheists, there is only one God, Al-Elah. We're wrong to be worshiping 360 gods. How do you think they responded to that? About the same way. Again, after a decade, had virtually no followers. But when he got to Mecca, he wound up arbitrating a peace agreement between two traditional warring Arab clans. All of a sudden, he wasn't a vagrant preacher trying to preach a conciliatory message encouraging people to follow him. All of a sudden, he was a prophet with muscle. And the message changed. The Quran has 114 surahs. They're not laid out uh, beginning to end as, as the earliest to latest. They're laid out by length of chapter. But it's very important because the latest surahs, the ones that were given in Medina, abrogate 
the early surahs, those that were given in Mecca. As the message, method, excuse me, message changed, so did the method. Early on, you see such verses as Surah 1094, where he is trying to encourage those to follow him. And he goes to those that are followers, or, or new followers, says, If you're in doubt, O Muhammad, about that which he have revealed to you, then ask those who have been reading the scripture before you. If you've got a question, go ask the Jews and the Christians. They'll help you out. Well, wonderful. I wish they still would. Surah 2, 256, there is no compulsion in religion. These were the early days as he was trying to use a conciliatory uh, manner in toward he, encouraging folks to follow him. But after he got to Medina, those verses were replaced by these. Therefore, when you meet the unbelievers and fight, smite at their necks at length. When you have thoroughly subdued them, bind a bond firmly on them. Surah 8.12, remember, thy Lord inspired the angels with the message, I am with you. Give firmness or encourage the believers. I will terrorize or instill terror in the hearts of the unbelievers. Smite you above their necks and smite all their fingertips off them. Surah 9.5, kill those who join other gods with Allah. Wherever you shall find them and see Seize them, besiege them, and lay wait for them in every kind of ambush. But if they convert and pay the obligatory alms, then let them go their way. In Surah 839, which is what I call the Great Commission, fight them until there is no more fitna, and the religion will be for Allah alone. This is an Islamic center just down the street from the state capitol. In fact, just down the street from the governor's mansion. It says on the top line, Ahu, Ahu, excuse me, Allahu Akbar. Now we've been told by our expert commentators that that means God is great. Well, that's not what it means. Kabir means great in Arabic. Allahu Akbar means God is greater or God is the greatest. Muhammad had preached for roughly 10 years, had less than 100 followers. Muhammad goes to Mecca, all of a sudden he's a prophet with muscle. All of a sudden, rather than trying to encourage people to follow him, it is submit or die. And with his jihadi warriors ride into a caravan, and you either have the choice of joining them and submitting and worshiping Allah through Muhammad the messenger, or you could die or be subjugated. So, hey, Allah is greater than the God of the Christians. Allah is greater greater than the God of the Jews. Allah is greater than the polytheistic gods. Allah who Akbar, Allah is the greatest. That's why in every country where Islam has conquered the prior authority, they must take the holy site and build their own mosque above the remains of the old holy site. Why? Allah is greater. Allah is the greatest. By the way, in summary, one al-Ilah. These artifacts were taken in 538 B.C., or originated in 538 B.C., from Nebunade's reign in Babylon. Notice the minaret with the crescent. Notice a modern minaret with a crescent. Notice the symbol of the crescent with the star. Notice the modern. This was Nebunade's worship of the moon god, Sin. This is Islam. The same al kaaba the same black stone that fell from heaven, the same sign of the crescent moon, the same prayer five times per day towards Mecca, the same pilgrimage, the same circling of al kaaba the same kissing of the black stone, the same holy month of fasting that begins and ends with the new moon. Is this really the same deity as the God of the Bible? Part three, what is Sharia? First of all, understand that Sharia is the supreme law for Muslims. It's not compatible with the U.S. Constitution because it is a constitution in and of itself. There can only be one supreme law of the land. Uh, a couple of slides in here I put in from uh, searchtruth.com. This is an Islamic website. It'd be like if you had Blue Letter Bible and you're doing some research in your Bible study. This is a strong pro-Islamic website. So let's see some of the commentary about, for instance, Quran Surah 2 says, at Mecca, Islam was mainly concerned with moral training. Well, that's what we talked about. For 10 years, he had preached a very conciliatory message, the inner man. At Medina, where a tiny Islamic state had been set up, the Quran had to turn its attention to the social, cultural, economic, political, and legal systems as well. It 
became a constitution, a rule of law. Look at this, search truth for Quran 5. After the Battle of the Trench, a significant battle in the history of Islam, it had become quite obvious to the Arabs that no power could suppress the Islamic movement. Now Islam was not merely a creed which ruled over the minds and hearts of the people, but had become a state which dominated every aspect of the life of the people who lived within its boundaries. Is it a religion or is it a constitutional rule of law? Rule of law. But the good thing for us is we don't have to worry about it because it's only for those people who live within its boundaries. Oh, I forgot. The Great Commission is to fight them until there is no more unbelief and the religion will be for Allah alone. Hassan Albanya, 1928, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, made this statement. It is the nature of Islam to dominate, not to be dominated, to impose its religion, morality, to impose its law on Arab nations, on Muslim nations, on all nations, and to extend its uh, spiritual influence, no, power, to the entire planet. We see, you say, well, that was 1928. Certainly they don't still believe that. Well, Muhammad Akif, former Supreme Guide for the International Muslim Brotherhood in, in 2005 said this, the Muslim Brotherhood is a global movement whose members, focus on that, we're going to come back to that in the next section, cooperate with each other throughout the world based on the same religious. Now remember, Muhammad was not just the spiritual leader, he was the political leader as well. At Medina, he became... Church and state, so to speak, became one. And he was the ultimate leader. So when you think of religion, just put slash state, as there is one leader, as there is, for instance, in Iran. Based upon the same religious slash state worldview, the spread of Islam until it what? Rules, Rules the world. As a matter of fact, Article 8 of the Muslim Brotherhood says Allah is its goal, the Prophet its model, the Quran its Jihad, its path, and death for the case of Allah is its most sublime belief. Omar Ahmad, the first president of the Council on American Islamic Relations, was uh, quoted in July 4th, 1998, in the San Ramon Valley Herald, saying that Muslims are not to assimilate to American society, but to deliver Islam's message. Islam isn't in America to be equal to any other faith, but to become dominant. The Quran should be the highest authority in America, and Islam the only accepted religion on earth. One of the challenges is in understanding the totality of Islam. Everything we need to know is in the Quran. We de don't need to look somewhere else. Now, folks, our motto, a pluribus unum out of many one. If someone wants to move to America and leave their homeland, leave France, leave Germany, come into America to assimilate, to become American, that great melting pot. They're not coming to assimilate. They're coming to settle, as we'll see here in some future slides. I have this front cover, uh, book Reliance of the Traveler. I brought it with me in case you'd like to glance at it. This is codified Sharia law. You can buy it on Amazon or you can visit any mosque and get a copy of it if you'd like to read it for yourself just to check me out. But I'd like to show you uh, this has been certified by the Chief Imam of Damascus. It's been certified by the Mufti of the Jordanian Armed Forces. It's been certified by the International Institute of Islamic Thought, which covers North America in case you're interested. Uh, certified by Al-Azhar University, which is the Harvard of Sunni Islam. Remember the premise, one of the challenges is understanding the totality of Islam. Everything we need to know is in the Quran. We don't need to look anywhere else. Remember, we're trying to state that this is complete control over the person. This is not religion. This is a constitution that governs anything and everything and anything. What do you mean by anything? Even to the point of going to the lavatory. Folks, there are three and a half pages devoted to how to properly go to the bathroom. In case any of you ladies are interested, you're supposed to put most of your weight on your left foot, don't spend much time there, and don't speak. Kind of kills the whole point in going to the bathroom in pairs of two and three, right? <laughs> jihad. We've been told that jihad is simply an inner struggle. What well, does mention that in this book? As a matter of fact, the opening paragraph says this, Jihad means to war against non-Muslims and is etymologically derived from the word muhahada, signifying warfare to establish the religion. And it's the lesser jihad. As for the greater jihad, it's the spiritual warfare against the lower self. Well, let's see if the proof is in the pudding. Because out of eight 
pages. We have eight pages dedicated to warfare, supposedly the lesser jihad, and one sentence making a passing reference to the inner struggle of the greater jihad. As a matter of fact, on this same page you see, fighting is prescribed for you, Quran 2, 2, 16, slay them wherever you find them, Quran 8, 489, fight the idolaters utterly, uh, Quran 9, 36, you see a quote here from the prophet, I have been commanded to fight people until they testify that there is no God but Allah, and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah and perform the prayer and pay zakat and if they say it they have uh, saved their blood and their possessions from me except for the rights of Islam over them and their final reckoning is with Allah. You go on over in some of the future other forward sections the caliph makes war upon the Jews, Christians, Zoroastrians until they become Muslim or else they pay the non-Muslim poll tax and then it quotes uh, Surah 929 fight those who do not believe in Allah or the last day who forbid what Allah is messenger so on and so forth. Eight pages devoted to jihad. One, pa one sentence talks about the inner struggle. Eight pages to warring against non-Christian, or excuse me, non-Muslims until they become Muslims. What do you think is the major jihad? Based upon the volume of evidence in their book, I would say it's that. What about apostasy? Well, certainly they don't stone people or kill people for apostatizing and leaving Islam. Well, According to the Sharia, they do. When a person who has reached puberty and a sane voluntarily apostatizes from Islam, he deserves to be killed. In such a case, it's obligatory for the caliph to ask him to repent and return to Islam. And if he does, it's accepted from him. But if he refuses, he is immediately killed. Well, do they still do that? Absolutely. You read about it all the time. Uh, Iran, we've still got pastors over there right now that are in prison that have renounced their Islam and become Christians, and they may face death for it. What about slander? You know, slander means not what we think it means. We think slander would be to say something that's untrue about someone. That's not what it means in Sharia. Slander means to say something that does damage to someone or might hurt them or hurt their feelings. Um, there's a difference. Well, let me just get back up here. Slander means to mention anything concerning a person that he would dislike, whether about his body, his religion, everyday life, self, whatever, so on. But notice, if you said anything about his religion that he would dislike, he gave an example down here from the life of Muhammad. Do you know what slander is? And they answered, Allah and his messenger know best. And he said, it is to mention of your brother that which he would dislike. And someone asked, well, what if it's true? And he replied, if it is as you say, then you have slandered him. If it is not, you have calumniated him. There's a difference between between lying about somebody and saying something that somebody doesn't like. Why is this important? Because right now I'm slandering Islam. Everything I'm telling you is completely true. However, it hurts the cause that they have here in our country. And what I thought was most compelling, in fact I almost fell out of my chair after the Benghazi debacle was when this pinhead was at the United Nations and got up and made this statement, the future must not belong to those who slander the prophet of Islam. That's the most Islamic statement I've ever heard him make in all of his life. Right. Marriage. Well, don't you love love and marriage? <laughs> Dating, choosing who you want to marry. Well, not in Islam. Guardians who may marry a virgin to a man without her consent. That'll be popular in America. <laughs> Guardians of two types, those who may compel their female charges to marry someone and those who may not. <laughs> okay. The only guardians who may compel their charge to marry are a virgin bride's father or father's father, grandfather. Compel means to marry her to a suitable match without her consent. Guys, am I making any of this up? Is this clear? Okay. No fabrication. Uh, rules of marriage, let's see, oh, we got important stuff. The wife's right to enter, there are rules within marriage. Guys, aren't you glad to hear this? In case there's any debate, it's kind of like the bathroom deal. It's spelled out specifically so there can be more misunderstanding. The wife's marital obligations, it's obligatory for a woman to let her husband have relationships with her immediately whenever he asks her. Point number one. Okay, men, who's in favor of that? Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> I don't think that's going to go over real well here either. Uh, and the wife has rights too. Wife's right to intimacy. Uh, one should make love to one's wife every four nights as is Ferris, since the number of wives one may have is four. <laughs> ah, 
permitting one's wife to leave the house. You know, this clarified a whole lot of disagreements between me and Cindy <laughs> once we got this established. By the way, my father-in-law, my mother-in-law, and my brother, uh, brother-in-law are here. But uh, permitting one's wife to leave the house, you say, certainly they don't still practice that. Yes, they do. The birthplace of Islam, if anybody knows the truth of Islam, it certainly would be Saudi Arabia. This was just a recent article, Saudi husbands alerted by text if their wives leave the country. As of last week, Saudi women's male guardians began receiving text messages on their phones informing them when women under their custody, don't you love that? <laughs> Ladies, you are going to love it. Uh, leave the country even if they are traveling together. Under laws influenced by the strict Wahhabi interpretation of Islam, women are not allowed to leave Saudi Arabia without permission from their male guardian, a husband, father, or brother. You must give consent by signing what is known as a yellow sheet at the airport or border. Ah, my favorite topic. It gets better. Dealing with a rebellious wife. <laughs> First of all, warn her with words. Maybe she just didn't understand you. The second one, I'll talk slower. That's right. <laughs> the second one will really get her. Kick her out of bed. Yeah, that'll bring my wife to her knees in six or seven months, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> and if that doesn't work, then he may hit her as long as she doesn't break bones or cause blood to flow. This is not a Christian pastor making up what he thinks is true about Islam. I am just reading from Sharia that is certified by the leading Islamic authorities of our day. You can buy that in any mosque today. You can go online at Amazon and buy it today and read it for yourself. This is Aisha Bibi in Afghanistan. She was nothing more than property. Her family had traded her to a very strict Wahhabi family as payment for a debt. She was nothing but property rather than this man's wife. She was forced to sleep with the animals. She attempted to escape. She was caught and returned to the family. They cut off her nose and her ears. This is the face of Sharia. Most important slide I saved for last as far as this topic. Topic of lying. Now, we all know lying's wrong. The Bible says thou shalt not bear false witness. <coughs> okay? Sharia. Speaking is a means to achieve objectives. If a praiseworthy aim is attainable through both telling the truth and lying, it is unlawful to accomplish through lying because there is no need for it. When it is possible to achieve such an aim by lying and not by telling the truth, then it is permissible to lie if attaining the goal is permissible and obligatory to lie if the goal is obligatory. Remember what the Great Commission was a while ago? Fight them until there is no more unbelief and the religion will be for Allah alone, for Islam alone. That is an obligatory command. So if I can accomplish my task by telling the truth, I'm supposed to tell the truth. But if I can only accomplish my task by lying, then I am obligated to lie in order to accomplish my task. So when Imam Faisal Abdul Rauf from the Ground Zero Mosque says that 90% of Sharia is uh, fully compatible with the United States Constitution, not only compatible, but is consistent and compatible with American laws, the areas of differences are small and minor, guess what he's doing? Lying. He's lying. Part number three, what about America? This man's name is Ismail El Barasi. Just a providential act of God, I believe, in October of 2004, Mr. El Barasi and his wife in full Islamic garb were seen driving back and forth the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. But authorities noticed something that was unusual as they were taking pictures, not of the scenery, but of the bridge's structure. The police pulled them over, investigated, and found out that he had a warrant is actually was a high-ranking member of the Muslim Brotherhood. They went and the FBI went and searched his home there just outside of uh, D.C. in Falls Church, Virginia. As a matter of fact, I went last time I was in D.C. I, I'm such a nerd, I drove over there and took a picture of the house. <laughs> but they searched his house and found in a hidden sub-basement 80 bankers' boxes full of documentation on the Muslim Brotherhood's efforts here in North America. Again, high-ranking board member. One of those documents was from this memorandum called an explanatory memorandum on the general strategic goal of the group in North America. 
Item four says, understanding the role of the Muslim brother in North America. The process of settlement, remember? You saw Omar, Mr. Omar Ahmad said a while ago, you're not here to assimilate. Okay, you're here to convey the message. The process of settlement is a civilization jihadist process with all that the word means. The Ikhwan, which means brother, Muslim brother, must understand that their work in America is kind of grand jihad in eliminating and destroying the Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of the believers, so they're using our own ignorance against us, plus their own efforts, so that it is eliminated, Western civilization here in America, and Allah's religion slash state is made victorious over all others. Without this level of understanding, we are not up to this challenge and have not prepared ourselves for jihad yet. Wait a second, I thought this was an inner struggle, was it not? It is a Muslim's destiny to perform jihad and to work wherever he is and wherever he lands until the final hour comes and there is no escape from that destiny. Well, with this information, the Department of Justice at that time under the Bush administration, as well as the FBI, put together a list of criminal organizations. They began prosecuting the Holy Land Foundation with its headquarters in the Dallas area. And when we think of giving money to charity, we think of um, children's hospitals, uh, funding missionaries and things of that nature. Uh, the Islamic idea of giving money to charity is funding the Hamas to drive the Jews into the Mediterranean Sea so that they can return the Holy Land to Islamic control. That's what the Holy Land Foundation was doing, raising money to fund Hamas and their efforts. Well, they were convicted on all 108 counts, sentenced to over 60 years in prison. So out of this list of 265 identified co-conspirators with terrorism. Number one was the Holy Land Foundation. They tackled them, knocked them out of the way. Now we're getting ready to proceed to number two. Along the list of documents that I talked about a moment ago in the 80 bankers boxes, they listed this, by the way, Muslim Brotherhood, Mr. El Barassi's information, a list of our organizations and the organizations of our friends. Number one on the list, the Islamic Society of North America, Muslim Brotherhood organization. You say, what does that have to do with us? Any mosque that begins with Islamic Society of, put the city in. This is part of the Islamic Society of North America. Islamic Society of Tulsa, Islamic Society of Oklahoma City, Islamic Society of Edmond, Islamic Society of Boston, with their antics this last year. Muslim Brotherhood, our organizations, our friends. Muslim Student Association has been in America since the 70s. They've been recruiting and influencing our university students and virtually every campus across the country. Uh, the North American Islamic Trust, I'll put that up here, you'll understand here in a little while. Basically this trust owns the mosques or the vast majority of mosques in America. Property in America is owned by this group, again Muslim Brotherhood Organization. Uh, down here you see the Islamic Association for Palestine. Remember this document here, 1992, it predated CARE. CARE was actually born out of the Islamic Association of Palestine, which was proven the FBI happened to be listening in at the, the organizational meeting in Philadelphia uh, in 1993 when CARE was born. So CARE was birthed out of the Islamic Association for Palestine, all part of the Muslim Brotherhood here in America. Now something tragic happened in 2008. Anybody remember what it was? Obama got Barack Obama got elected. <laughs> and with him we had a new attorney general named Eric Holder. And when Eric Holder got into office we still had a list of 246 co-conspirators to terrorism who were yet unindicted. They'd planned on working their way down the list because this was an open and shut case. Like I said, the first one, Holy Land Foundation, guilty on all 108 counts. Evidence was overwhelming. But with the new Department of Justice, all of a sudden this became a cold case. They sealed the boxes. They are no longer available for public to review. And we have 246 unindicted co-conspirators still functioning freely in America, tied to the Muslim Brotherhood, tied to, tied to Hamas. One thing that was really smart, though, well, actually it worked out well for us. Not so smart on their part. But three of the organizations, the Council of American Islamic Relations, the Islamic Society of North America, and the North American Islamic Trust, sued to have their names removed from this list of unindicted co-conspirators, thinking that it would damage their efforts here in America. So it was proven one in the Holy Land Foundation, once in the Holy Land Foundation draws, 2008, they appealed and it was listened to again by U.S. District Judge Jorge Solis. 
uh, in 2009, he ruled this, the government has produced ample evidence to establish the Association of the Council of American Islamic Relations, the Islamic Society of North America, the North American Islamic Trust, with the Holy Land Foundation, the Islamic Association for Palestine, and with, can anybody read what that word is? Hamas. Hamas. Recognized terrorist organization. Folks, am I making this up? Okay, I brought it here just so you can see this for yourself. Uh, a little over a year ago, uh, Representative Peter King out of New York held a big hearing. You remember he was called all sorts of hateful names. Basically, just covering the evidence that I just presented to you. You see here it says, uh, I write to inquire about your decision to prosecute the 246 individuals and organizations named as unindicted co-conspirators in a Hamas terror financing case, the U.S. versus the Holy Land Foundation. I've been reliably informed that the decision not to seek indictments of the Council of American Islamic Relations and its co-founder Omar Ahmad, Islamic Society of North America, Nate, and so on and so forth, uh, was usurped by high-ranking officials at the Department of Justice headquarters over the vehement and stated objections to a special agents and supervisors of the FBI as well as the prosecutors of the U.S. Attorney's Office in Dallas who investigated and successfully prosecuted the Holy Land Foundation case. Would you provide the following answers? What are the reasons for the department's decisions not to prosecute Care Isna Nate and Mr. Ahmad, who is a Care co-founder and former head of the Palestinian Committee of the Muslim Brotherhood in the U.S.? Who made the final decision not to prosecute? Who, if anyone from the executive office of the president, consulted with, advised, or otherwise communicated with the Department of Justice in electronic, oral, written, regarded uh, Department of Justice uh, decisions to not seek the indictments of Care Isna Nate and Mr. Ahmad? He goes on in detail what we have just covered, quoting what we had just covered. Sent this letter to the attorney. <laughs> Attorney General demanding a response and an explanation and guess what he got? Nothing. Nothing. This is my hometown. This is University of Central Oklahoma. This is property that's owned right across the street from the University of Central Oklahoma. They just were, they're attempting to do a major expansion, build a mega mosque here, but notice who the owner is, North American Islamic Trust. Remember the North American Islamic Trust is proven twice in federal court to be an affiliate with Hamas. And remember what Mr. Okef said, the former leader of the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood is a global movement whose members cooperate with each other. Care, Isna, Nate, Holy Foundation, Islamic Association of Palestine, Hamas, uh, who cooperate with each other throughout the world based on the same religious slash state worldview, the spread of Islam until it rules the world. And remember also what Sharia commands. If the goal is obligatory and the only way to accomplish your goal is to lie, then you are obligated to lie. I'll leave this one final slide. Uh, Elijah Abraham is a former uh, Muslim. He was actually born in Baghdad uh, during the long Iran-Iraq war. His father managed to facilitate his escape from the country in order to save his life. He wound up going to England first, then wound up in America. Uh, strangely enough, wound up in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, early 20-something Muslim. Prayers weren't being answered. He said, he, by his own testimony, he says there's only two conclusions. Either there is no God or I'm trying to reach God the wrong way. He says, evidence demands that there's a God. You look outside, look into the stars at night. This isn't an accident. There was a creator. So if there is a God, obviously I'm trying to reach him the wrong way because my prayers aren't being answered. Elijah said, I, Elijah said I'm going to try every religion until I find what works. Well, being in Oklahoma, he happened to be across the street from a Baptist church. I mean, what are the odds of that happening? And he walked across the street Sunday and he said he was literally loved into Christ became a Christian within a couple of years, wound up surrendering to preach. He is now a Baptist evangelist missionary. He travels the world trying to reach Muslims for Christ, as well as others. He's preached in my church many times. Elijah does not hate Muslims. Elijah still has family that's Muslim in Iraq. He came out of that, but he certainly knows what he's talking about. He says this, now notice the distinction because this is important for us to hear. There is a difference between the ideology and the people. Okay? Elijah says this, Islam is not a religion. Islam is a socio-political system that uses a deity to advance its agenda of global conquest. Mm -hmm. Jesus did not die for Islam. Why? Because Islam is a socio-political system. It is a philosophy. Islam is a satanic ideology. Elijah's words. But Muslims are people who need Jesus. That's what we must remember. 
Islam overall has an agenda to conquer the world. But Muslims are people that need the love of Christ. We have to keep that in balance.